Hi, I'm James McGuire, and today we're talking about data analytics in the year 2021, future trends in analytics. To discuss that, I'm joined by three major thought leaders. With me is Andy Mann, Chief Technology Advocate at Splunk. Andy, you have almost survived all of the year 2020. Congratulations to you. Thank you. It feels like an accomplishment, James. It's great to be here. <laughs> Doesn't it, though? Uh, also with me is Mike Cavis, Managing Director at Deloitte Consulting. Hello to you, Mike. Hey, how you doing? It's great to be here. And uh, I, I have uh, how not to do your own hair. That's what I got going. <laughs> and your background, tell me, tell me where that background is, Mike. That is a tasting room at Jack Daniels Distillery. Oh, right. there's some history there. Wow, okay. Yeah. It's a, a very serious place. Which is usually what I use on Fridays, late meetings, to remind people that it's late Friday. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh, rounding out our panelists, Mark Thiele, CEO, and I think co-founder of Edgevana. Hello to you, Mark. Hey, thanks, James. I appreciate being asked to join. Um, uh, to your point about 2020 and everybody's point about haircuts, my haircut is great. I just don't get one. <laughs> and uh, and That's um, one way to go about it. And, and uh, is it still 2020? I thought it was like 2027 already. It's, I don't know. It's, it's been a long year. It, 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 yeah. is, it has indeed been a long year. Yeah. So I want to get sort of a portrait of where we are with data analytics now. But before I do that, I want to thank our, our viewers and listeners. Thank you so much for showing up and for listening and watching. Uh, and also, we welcome your comments and your questions. I mean, there, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. You know where it is. Go ahead and click that at any point. You don't need to wait until the end and, and comment, ask a question. We welcome your feedback. So uh, where are we with data analytics now? Let's get kind of a, a level set, a, a portrait. I mean, companies have gone out and spent all this money on, on expensive data analytics platforms, sometimes a number of them for one company. Let, let's hope they interoperate. Uh, is it actually working for the companies? Are they really using it? Are, are they failing or, or maybe they're succeeding beautifully? Andy, what is, what is your view from the trenches? Uh, look, my, my view is that the, the future is here, but it's unevenly distributed, right? Mm -hmm. um, data analytics is absolutely working for some businesses. You look at, especially retail, for example, you look at uh, dynamic pricing, um, you're, especially like dynamic pricing on, on airlines, on products from online stores, these sorts of things. Um, you look at some of the activities within my world, in the IT operations and DevOps world, using analytics to understand customer engagement levels and, and anomaly detection for problems or security breaches. That's mm -hmm. absolutely working. There's a lot of analytics that's working both at business level and at technology level, but there's a lot that's not. We're in the revolutionary stage, I think. And I've always had this theory that first comes the revolution, then comes the management. And you can talk about that in real terms, political terms, uh, but you can talk about that in sort of technology terms as well. We're at the revolutionary stage yet. We're trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. We're making experiments. Some things are working beautifully. Some things are failing. It's unevenly distributed. It's uncontrolled to a large degree as well. I worry a lot about data ethics and how we put ourselves and our biases into analytics, machine learning, and AI. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's definitely results coming out, but it's all very uneven. But, but by the control part, you mean, in other words, people are, are gathering data and perhaps using it to make decisions that maybe that's crossing some privacy line? Absolutely. Are crossing yeah. privacy, but also making inaccurate or incomplete decisions based on incomplete data sets. Hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's something I read a long, long time ago. Uh, it was actually an advertisement on the London Underground. I can't even remember what it was advertising. And a big headline that said, travel broadens the mind. Hmm. And it talked about how that was absolutely false. Because mm. if I go to, say, Athens, and I meet, some, I meet five people in Athens, and then I come back, I go, now I know what Greece is like. <laughs> right. It's absolutely false. Right. Um, I think I know what Greece is like because I've traveled there, but I don't know. I think yeah. we're in that with analytics as well. We think mm. we know what's right, but incomplete data sets are not giving us the right answers. I know, I know the mad Greek. I know that all Greeks are mad. I mean, what else do I need? <laughs> Which brings us to Mr. Mike Cavus. I mean, what, 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 what do you see down in the trenches, Mike? Are, are companies really succeeding with these, these high-priced platforms they bought or, or not necessarily? I, I think at the product level, sometimes it's succeeding. So certain services or products are backed by data, but as corporate strategy, not so much. And, and one of the reasons is, you know, First of all, where is all my data? Is it any good? You know, is it 
different information and different silos. So I think as a, a corporate strategy, and this goes back to when big data was first the term, right? And everything was on-prem, people were buying all this stuff, but they didn't have use cases for it, right? And so there was a lot of failures. Now, you know, stuff's cheap on the cloud, you know, consumption's cheaper, storage cheaper. And I now I think products and services are really taking it, you know, just like, you know, Andy works for Splunk. They're really taking advantage of this technology as part of their product. So I see it there. I see, like you mentioned, retail uh, and pharmaceutical and some of these, they have great use cases where they're leveraging this stuff and, and really making a difference. But I just don't see corporate enterprise-wide strategies going anywhere. And you, you think they're still running, running things by, by gut instinct or, or industry knowledge at that, that higher level? Well, I'm not sure anything at enterprise level actually ever works. <laughs> right. um, it, it's hard, but I, I think when it's driven by a use case, then things get narrow. You have to make decisions. You have a deadline. I think it works. When it's a large initiative to do something, it's just hard. And, you know, there's data everywhere. and There's all kinds of challenges. So mm -hmm. that's Mark, what I see. Are, are, are companies really paying attention to the metrics? And, and do the metrics mean something to them? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, first, I agree with most most everything that um, Andy and, and Mike have already mentioned. Um, uh, I would say that um, one of the key problems most companies have is not being able to, one, identify metrics, or two, identify data that they think is important to those metrics. But it's their ability as an organization to be able to act on the information that's created. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you can have all the great metrics you want. You could have instant turnaround information on, on uh, um, customer interaction with your company's products, uh, as an example. But if, you, if it takes you two weeks or two months or whatever to react and, and respond to that data, then you've lost most of the value associated with it. So a, a big part of analytics, in my mind, is the, in, sorry, we got a delivery and my dog is freaking out. <laughs> the, the, those Amazon um, logistics they decided to do it right yeah. now. They made they made a, a decision based on the metrics. You would be that's right. Order. That's right. And so it's it's a um, uh, it generally speaking, what I'm seeing from a success standpoint are those that have um, a, a fairly large target of opportunity for said analytics. And where I'm seeing it is on uh, in two places. Other than what was mentioned already, retail is a great example. I mean. Uh, you could say Walmart's been great at analytics for years, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, even in the early days of, of big data analytics, they've been good for years. Um, but what I'm really seeing it uh, is factory floor and in large critical infrastructure where people are using analytics against uh, expensive equipment uh, and making real-time decisions about repair cycles and even refueling schedules on um, on uh, uh, truck routes uh, and things like that, that lead to greater efficiencies and um, and overall improved performance or safety, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I, I talking... agree with that. Yeah, I think ahead, those are the use case things where they're actually transforming business models um, right. with specific use cases like that. Uh, let's talk about analytics at the edge. I mean, it's been a real, real issue for several years now. Are we going to crunch, crunch data at the edge out where the Internet of Things and all those many devices are sending back torrents of data? Are we going to crunch it there at the edge or are we going to send it back to, to headquarters, to the data center to, to crunch it? I mean, you know, how important is analytics at the edge in, in the coming year? Andy, what is your hunch in this regard? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to defer to Mark to this uh, to the great degree. I know he's an expert in edge and edge computing and so forth, right. but... Right. From my position at the at the center of the analytics world, analytics everywhere. Data is coming from so many places and industrial IoT especially. The data is critically important. As Mark said, some of this stuff is like, is my turbine going to fail catastrophically causing me a million dollars worth of damage? Mm -hmm. Or can I spend a day shutting it down, doing some preventative maintenance, lose a grand, but get it working again? When that turbine is sending me signals every millisecond that says, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Do I really need to use the bandwidth to transmit that to a central location to realize that turbine's fine? But I need that one data point that says, eh, not so fine. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it will happen anywhere, everywhere, but I, I would certainly, I deal mostly with centralized enterprise style analytics. I think the edge will be a hub for analytics as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Mark, you have been deferred to, and, and the, the name of your company is Edge Vana, for goodness sake. So I'm sure you sure. might have an opinion on this. Is, is, is Edge so. going to be important in terms of analytics in the year 2021? Oh, well, I think um, uh, they're both, obviously, they're both important to each other. Uh, I mean, Edge is an, is an incredible opportunity to collect new data and use that data in new ways. And uh, what we're finding, uh, most of the customers that I've worked with, uh, friends that I've worked with who are doing things around Edge, uh, my initial efforts around Edge have indicated that uh, data volumes tend to be a lot bigger than what most people originally anticipated. Um, and once they start uh, solving for one problem, they realize they can solve for additional problems, which only magnifies the data collection and reuse opportunity. And to Andy's point, uh, uh, simply said, it doesn't make sense in most cases to send that data somewhere else. But in, in real terms, from an ROI standpoint, in many cases, it's just not financially viable to send the data somewhere else. So you, yeah. well, Edge historically has been defined as a latency driven opportunity or opportunities that benefit largely from latency. Um, latency in many cases will actually be a positive byproduct of the fact that in order to get value out of the data and do it at the lowest possible cost, you'll wanna crunch uh, the analytics against it right there where it's created. And I'll say, Mark, one, other thing, one thing that occurs to me is that increasingly business is done at the edge, right? And it's, a, it's an accordion. We always go in and out, in and out. But right mm -hmm. now we're going more out. And the, the, the ability to communicate rapidly at high bandwidth with things like 5G, mm -hmm. um, the ability to, to have massive compute power in tiny, tiny boxes uh, at the edge, um, the real-time commerce that happens from edge devices communicating internally and externally, it just seems to me that, so at your point, so much of the data that we rely on to do analytics to create business value actually comes from the edge in the first place. Why would we not start to analyze it at, at the source? Because like you said, the cost, the time, the latency of making a decision centrally for edge data, for an edge use case, doesn't seem to make sense to me. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a question sent in from uh, one of our, uh, our, our viewers, actually, on that very same topic. It's from Rob Hirschfeld, who happens to be the co-founder and chief executive officer at Racken. Uh, he asks, is, is He's trying to stop for... us. Yeah, just reject it. Just, just reject <laughs> it. I, I've, yeah. I've, I've, tr I've tried yeah. to block him. The technology will not let me block him. I don't know how, what's, what's happening. So. He asked, is there a case where data generated at the edge does not make it back to the cloud? I think we've kind of talked about that. Uh, he also asked, what roles, do, what roles do edge AI play in those transfers? That's, that's a very sort of next gen question. Mark, since you might be our edge expert, what, what roles do edge AI play, play in those transfers? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's interesting because we could, uh, similar to the topic of the original, one of the original themes of the analytics topic, we could talk about AI in the same light in the sense that there's a lot more AI in uh, advertising than there is in effective utilization right now in most enterprises. Um, but given that, I believe that um, the volume of data and the speed with which we're expecting action on it, um, and realistically, over the long term, the value of prime real estate uh, at the edge of a house, uh, in a city, in a car, uh, wherever it happens to be, um, uh, there are actions creating data mean that AI run against that data to evaluate determinations on uh, compliance, privacy, security, long-term retention, whether or not it needs to be backed up, whether some portion of this data needs to be sent somewhere else for long-term trending, uh, or whether 97% you know, of it can be dumped right now and the 3% retained for long-term trending on site. Mm -hmm. Mike, what, what is your sense in terms of uh, analytics at the edge in the coming years? Is it gonna be really the, the big deal? Yeah, I'll give you a, an example where it isn't an example where it is. So um, I'll, I'll use the example of uh, a wind turbine, right? So wind turbines have all these sensors on them and they have actuators on them. The actuator will like help shift the angle of the blades to maximize capacity of energy. In that model, you, you set up, you set it up to, with intelligence that says, hey, if the wind changes by this much, go change the blade. So in that case, you know, you don't need real-time AI. You already have an instruction set there. What you do is you trickle back the relevant data to go back to the data center to figure out the why, why, you know, and the how, and then you go back to the edge and you you change the instruction set. So in that case, you know, it, it's it's a pretty static environment. Now you look at like smart traffic. 
smart traffic is a combination of you know there, there's you have to look at what's happening now and make decisions and there's a component of machine learning there over time your your algorithms get smarter and and there really isn't much of a need to go but definitely in real time there's no need to go back you may want to go back to do some analytics or something but really everything has to happen on the edge there there's no real cloud in that real-time solution so you know th this is a challenge to architects right i mean there's no it's not a binary thing you have to look at each thing look at what makes sense and what you have enough money to do too because there's money involved either way so mm -hmm. oh indeed uh we we have a question from uh, mr tim crawford which i think the three of you know um he asked that it seems like pretty pre pre simple something to possibly worry about do you think we are running too fast into edge and not spend enough time to consider the risk. All, the, all, those, all those little IoT devices could easily be hacked, et cetera. All those APIs could be hacked. Um, Andy, what's your sense? Is there, is, is there a risk we're, we're waiting in deep waters here? James, this is my ongoing thesis that we continue to go forward without fixing what we've already done. Mm -hmm. um, I would just ask anyone here who has a joy connecting their Bluetooth devices. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> Two thumbs way up, Andy. Two thumbs way up. <laughs> First we, thing in the morning. <laughs> As a technology industry, this is what we do. I don't know whether we can ask whether it's right or wrong, whether we're fast or slow. It's just what we do. Mm -hmm. We create new technologies and we rush to the next new technology. Um, and in a lot of cases, I, my entire world has been about management of technologies because you know, I, I haven't invented new technologies. I've invented a lot of ways to better manage new technologies. That's where I think we'll go with edge. You know, I think that's where we'll go with analytics, where we'll go with edge. We will continue to innovate and iterate and do exciting new things. But ultimately, we do need to get some controls on this that don't exist at the moment. I think that's true, regardless of whether it's edge or not. We do see, I think we, we're excited by analytics as we see it happening in the central reservation. That excites us for what we could be doing at the edge. Regardless of the fact that we've still got a lot of centralized analytics management to do, Edge is providing the opportunity. So, of course, we're going there. Mm -hmm. Mark, you see a big danger lurking in, in, in the Edge that maybe we're, we're rushing to, into too fast? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the simple answer, I mean, I, I agree with everything Andy said. Um, we tend to rush into new technologies too fast every time. It's not unusual at the Edge. And the difference with the Edge is that <clears throat> instead of solving for uh, you know, slightly better database management or uh, a faster server or uh, a better NIC card uh, and worrying about the security and, and um, adoption of that particular technology, we're effectively rushing into creating the next equivalent of the beginning of the internet hmm. from a scale and opportunity standpoint. And no one wants to be left behind. Right. There's a there's a hesitation for some in deploying things that really make uh, that really cost money from a capital expense standpoint, because there's a little nervousness about, you know, should I build it and wait for them to come type of approach. But for for enterprises and even cities, uh, et cetera, the opportunity associated with uh, managing everything from the factory floor to retail outlets to um, city centers uh, to uh, traffic management, et cetera. The opportunity is just too big to miss, even at the individual enterprise level, let alone at the overall larger marketplace opportunity standpoint. Yeah, and just Mike's uh, example of the of cars and the self-driving car, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of hype, a lot of energy, and a lot of development and advancement in that space. And of course, you need to be out doing analytics at the edge for that sort of stuff. You know, new technologies create this new need, and we, we're not going to stop creating new edge technology. So of course, we're going to continue to build this need. I love that example, by the way, Mike, um, the, the idea of the, the driverless car, the sensors they've got. I know I live in Boulder where NCAR and NOAA and NWS have big locations. They do a lot of research here. Intercar communication based on weather and traffic conditions, a car uh, in ahead of, you know, 300 yards ahead of me all of a sudden skids on black ice. So the ABS locks up. I already know the heater's on, the windscreen wipers are on. Communicate back to that car some basic analytics saying, hey, black ice up ahead, slow down, low pressure on the brakes. These sorts of things in real time has to happen that way. So I love that example, by the way, Mike. Well, what about the idea of, of, of artificial intelligence and analytics? We, we've talked about this a little bit. I mean, it seems like the, the level of buzz around AI right now is, is pretty much deafening. 
is is a, is AI going to be completely central to, to data analytics in, in the year ahead? Uh, Mike, what is your view on that? I, I keep going back to use cases. There are use cases where it makes sense to make those investments. Um, and, and I think, you know, COVID is driving some of that because a lot of what AI does is it takes tasks that we already know and, and does it for us, where machine learning is more about learning things we don't know and doing it for us. So there's a lot, I see a lot of companies saying, I don't want to be in a call center business anymore. Let's do, you know, the whole, you know, AWS call center AI thing. I see a lot of, you know, a lot of people had to reduce staff and they, they looked at AI. But from a cloud perspective, our, our, the systems we're building are becoming, whether it's on-prem or public, they're becoming complex and highly distributed and humans just can't manage that anymore, right? So you need to leverage artificial, you know, you used to have, you know, this rack of servers and you could look at them. Now there's, your servers are coming and going. You need AI to help you, you know, run these things at scale. Uh, James, if I could jump in really quick, I mean, uh, this may or may not be an appropriate analogy. Again, I don't know that there are that many people that could claim to be experts at both AI and how the edge will develop and how AI should be best used, et cetera. Right. Although there certainly are plenty of people that I know of that are really, really smart about AI specifically. But to, to Mike's point, to kind of elaborate on that, uh, everyone that knows me knows I, know, I love analogies. And I see AI sort of uh, right now as being the traditional, very old style help desk, where no matter what you wanted, you got the person who only knew enough to piss you off and then send you to level two, right? <laughs> but don't, aren't, aren't and, the so, system learning though as, as, as that, they go? That's they're, right. They're, they're getting more intelligent. You know, that's that's right. And so over right now, a lot of what the AI is, is trying to get rid of those initial things that they're like, where do I go when I go here? Give me the answer. Uh, you know, what's, what's the security protocol for that? Give me the answer. And then over time, they're going to get more and more intelligence right at the edge. And the benefit there is that, you know, to reference a, a friend of mine's company, uh, um, Simon Crosby, Swim.ai, you know, they've, they've picked a, a, a portion of uh, edge opportunity and are doing analytics against it before the data is collected and stored and documented and sent to a thousand different places so that the part of the data that they actually use is this much. And that's how much is retained. So even though they're going through petabytes of data over the course of a month in any given city, the retention is measured in gigabytes. Andy, what do you see in terms of data analytics? Is, uh, is AI going to basically you know, become so central we almost forget about you know, the data analytics as this major force? Yeah, look, the joke is that, that you sell AI, but you hire ML developers, right? Um, <laughs> It, it, to Mike's point, mostly it's machine learning, right? Artificial intelligence, the ability to, uh, to have a bunch of known knowns and a bunch of unknown unknowns and still adapt to that, right? <laughs> mostly it's machine learning. We use machine learning quite a lot in terms of anomaly detection, for example, right? This is, a, this is about getting a novel situation, but being able to interpret it based on existing knowledge and training you've got. I see the same patterns every day. That's normal. If I see a pattern that spikes, and now I know that's abnormal. That's machine learning. Machines can learn that. What machines can't do is the what I think of as actual artificial intelligence, and they can't really do it yet. Innovation, creative leaps, um, mm -hmm. understanding you know, really complex disconnected data sets. Um, these are things which, you know, there's a lot of stuff humans still do a lot better. I think that AI is coming. We see the vestiges of it in early ML and some advanced ML stuff. Um, and the thing about AI is, you know, if it is it significantly intelligent to, for me to not be able to distinguish it from a human? Absolutely not. We are not passing a Turing test with any AI I've seen anytime soon. But we are applying advanced analytics and machine learning. So the machine is more intelligent than it was and is able to do things automatically. To Mike's point, this idea of, of being able to react to known knowns automatically, that it's effective AI. And I, I actually like to think of, of, of this in terms more of augmentation than artificial. I think augmented intelligence is fully legitimate. It's where we are starting to be. It will be real in very short amount of time for a large number of use cases. Do I think artificial intelligence will be? I don't think that's in the realm of, of anything but science fiction in the, in the near future, at least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Before we leave our AI uh, discussion, Mr. Crawford has one more question. Uh, is, is, is AI a requirement for edge? Uh, I would say yes, if you're going to be really competitive. And similarly, is, is cloud a requirement for edge? She's like, there's th th that, that's really blurry. Uh, beyond a yes, no response, what is the advantage, disadvantage? That's a big question. Mark, you're the, you're the person for this question. Yeah, I would say that the, there's a, um, a, while I agree with Andy's point, assuming we still call what people are using today, and for the most part, AI, even though most of it, as Andy described, I would describe as math with good trend and, or not math, but ML with good math and trend analysis, right? right? And people call that AI, the answers from that AI. But I would say that, yes, that's important to edge for any number of reasons. One is because just thinking about a majority of the opportunities associated with the edge, you're talking about almost always instantaneous transactions or, or millisecond by millisecond um, information flow. And so the ability to correlate that new bit of information or data against thousands or millions or billions of other uh, potential corresponding data points and coming up with answers quickly is vital to the success of the edge. As far as cloud is concerned, I would say yes, pick, pick a technology. I would say yes, because edge is not gonna be solved by one person, it's not gonna be solved by one company, and it's certainly not gonna be solved by one deployment model. People are still very successfully deploying. I never thought this would be true. If you'd asked me this three years ago, I would have said no way, but people are successfully deploying what I would euphemistically call distributed infrastructure. Hmm. In, in effectively, it's highly managed instances of virtual machines uh, at, at what could be considered the edge, whether that's the edge of an on-premise or edge at the side of a road or in a factory or whatever the case may be. Um, and you know, my, my long-term hope is that at some point we have supply of edge solutions that are equivalent to, uh, loosely equivalent to a distributed horizontal cloud where any one location is a piece of the capacity and, and operational capability of a larger set of units. Right, so that whether it's managing flow of traffic, whether it's uh, maintaining three set three millisecond latency across the course of a of a large city um, or some combination of things, I think that that's a, a real opportunity space going forward. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's see if we can give some tangible advice to, to to managers and other people who need to deal with uh, you know running data analytics in the following year. What, what advice would you give uh, that manager, Mike, if, if he or she wants to use data analytics? better in, in the year ahead, maybe forget some of the old mistakes. Uh, what, what, what tips would you give them? I always go back to focus on business value. Too often it's technology for technology's sake. So hey, let's stand up a data lake. Let's go do the, uh, fi uh, find a use case. Cause what happens is when there's a use case and someone at the end is expecting a deliverable, decisions get made, data magically gets cleansed, you know, action happens. And so, you know, technology for sake of technology just are projects that never end and spend a lot of money and don't get a lot of results. But uh, leveraging it for business outcomes, it, it could even change business models or drastically improve productivity, those types of things. I, I would focus on value. Mm -hmm. what, what, what would it mean to focus on value? In other words, a really tangible result or what, so, what, what does that come down to? So, for example, let, let's see. Um, so let's use a retail example, right? Um, using analytics to improve shelving and inventory and supply chain or something like that. So mm -hmm. aligning it with something that's going to provide value either to your company or to your customers, as opposed to, hey, let's create another MDM project, right? Let's get all of our data and let's get it over here and let's let's run a hypothesis. There, there's no end to that game. And there's 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 not a lot of prioritization in that. And it, and it kind of dies at the vine. We've seen that with before cloud with big data, right? Everyone, big data, big data, everyone out and bought all these things and got all this data. And it just, it was like a hammer looking for a nail. Right, it's, it's out there. Andy, what, what advice would you give to some, uh, some challenged manager that individuals, you know, wants to move ahead with their data analytics in the year ahead? What, what, what advice would you give them? Yeah, um, I just start with, I, I definitely agree with Mike, you know, <clears throat> when you think about it, what is the saying, imagination without execution is just hallucination. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, absolutely have a use case in mind, find some way you can prove value. But beyond that, I would say, collect more data and share it. Um, 
it gets it gets to two really important areas when you do this. One is you deliver more value because you have more data upon which to make better decisions. You make faster decisions. So this is research, by the way, that I've done with the Enterprise Strategy Group. And you can see it, my shameless plug for the day at spunk.com. Mm -hmm. um, and we looked at this idea of data and data analytics and where do you get your data from and what value does it provide? And we found that the more data you collect and the more you operationalize that data, the more you share that data, you actually get better outcomes, empirical outcomes, revenue increase, cost reduction, innovation, speed, agility. And it actually makes sense. The more data you have to make a decision, the faster you can make the decision, um, especially if you have a good analytic tool set. So I would say collect more data. The other thing that it does, it reduces that bias the more data you have available to you, the more likely you are to make less of your own personal opinions and, and biases. Mm -hmm. And so you can look at the data and say, well, the data says this, and so I can go with that because I know I have a complete data set. So yes, beyond absolutely agreeing with Mike, I would say collect and share more data to make better decisions faster and more effectively without bias. It seems that the difficult part of that is, is the sharing part of the companies that are resistant to sharing data in some ways, like, oh, goodness, we've got to keep our, our data pigeonholed or, or safe or besides, then there becomes the, the actual logistics of sharing data. Like, how do we move it around? Who has time to look at it? I mean, it, the sharing part is the tougher part. True or false? Yeah, it's absolutely true. And you think, you know, the example use case I always talk about is getting data out of a network switch, right? So that data tells you customer information because it's got payload data. What am I buying? How much am I spending? Who am I? So it's got information for business analytics, but it also has performance data. How long is the round trip time for that transaction? Uh, is the transaction working? Is it failing? Is it going out, but not coming back in? It also has security data. So who's coming in? Where are they coming in from? Are they hitting this same port repeatedly? Are they doing legitimate transactions or not? So I've got three constituents already who want access to that one single data point. But we certainly see, for example, the security team says, no, this is security data. It's important that I own this because if I let anyone else see it, they might be able to expose some you know, processes or methods for getting right. into my organization so they mm -hmm. hug it to themselves the business people look at this data and they go but this is about business data this is not about it it doesn't need this i need right. access to this quickly to make decisions so and you can see where i'm going here right. um, yes everyone wants to have their own data no one wants to share their data but everyone wants everyone else's data it's a <laughs> real problem we've got to get over these boundary lines that stop us doing effective business across functions what, what i've seen a lot in in both fintech and healthcare is the sharing of models. Hmm. So it's not, they're not sharing the data, but they're all trying to save the same problem, especially, I mean, look at people trying to solve the COVID vaccine. There's a lot of different companies doing hypotheses and sharing models and collectively trying to solve problems. I even hmm. see that, I was surprised to see that in fintech where they're all starting to share models to engage with customers and stuff like that. So I see a lot of involvement in sharing machine learning models more than, you know, here's, you know, they're not sharing customer data that way, but they're sharing methods of solving right. problems, right? Interesting. Mark, what advice would you give to a manager who wants to, you know, use data analytics better in the year 2021? I, I mean, I hate to, to be boring because I think it's a simple answer that both Andy and Mike have mentioned, but it's, um, it's really being pointed at what problem it is you're trying to solve to begin with, mm -hmm. right? I mean, um, the, you know, anything, uh, having a lot of money in theory could take a, a smart entrepreneur and, and build the next uh, Google or Facebook or, or whatever, or it could be wasted on Coke and, 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 um, and Jack Daniels. Uh, well, okay, maybe, that's, maybe, that's not a waste. maybe that's not a waste, right? <laughs> Arguable. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, data, as, as Andy pointed out, data uh, can be vital, um, but I, and, and is vital, but uh, too many of us make the assumption that uh, magic will come from data um, just because we've collected a lot of it. And um, it's really uh, the most important piece is, is knowing what you're looking for uh, and being able to ask the right questions of it. Uh, and then I tend to agree that adding more data to the pool um, will often help uh, reduce the risk of bias uh, and potentially give you deeper answers. But um, you know, you know, people 
it, I've, I'm, if I had to pick a concern relative to our conversation today is that I would say that all three of us uh, are, uh, as panelists, uh, are old enough to remember each of the most recent, you know, the last 15 years worth of data trends. Mm -hmm. And it seems for the most part, and I'm, I'm just throwing a number out there, is it 70, 30, 80, 20 of failure to success? That it's like before we actually finish uh, a data warehouse and make it really successful at every level of business or data lakes or data analytics or whatever it is, it's like we've already, by, by the time the, the bottom 70% of enterprises, and I don't mean bottom like they're at the bottom of the rung, but the, the, the followers uh, are attempting to adopt, it's already forgotten and we're on to the next thing. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dangerous place and it's an expensive place place um, to, to, to go without having a really, really directed vision for what you're trying to do. And I mean, this, you know, most people are looking at, at data in a big way, along with customers and efficiency, as part of their digital transformation journey. Mm -hmm. And I would bet that both of my co-panelists would agree with the fact that uh, everybody agrees that digital transformation is the right thing to do. But anybody that's ever tried to do digital transformation would also agree that it's the best way to screw over your organization if you don't have a clear vision for what it is you're trying to get to, right? And that applies to how you plan to use the data, who's gonna be responsible for it, how are you gonna maintain it, how are you gonna validate it, all those things. What's funny about that, it, uh, back when solo was a thing, I think that's where we all got connected originally 10, 15 years ago, yeah. I had a deck on solo and transformation and I could take that deck and I could take replace SOA with AI, cloud, edge. It's a, it's, it's the same thing, right? You, you have to rethink the way you're organized, rethink the business processes, you know, and, and at, underneath all this, all the data in the world isn't any good if the data sucks, right? So, and we've seemed to have never fixed our data over all these years. So, you know, the technology is only as good as the data we're throwing at it. I mean, I, it sounds trite, James, um, and, and maybe it's not that important to the conversation, but you know, data comes from a lot of places, right? And most people, when they first think of data, they think of a structured database, something that looks like a really, really advanced version of an Excel spreadsheet, right? right. And, and traditionally, that's where data has come from. And then uh, in the late aughts, we started really thinking of more unstructured data sources, et cetera, et cetera. So when I think of data, I think of all of the intelligence that's created as part of an organization. And the reality is, is that a major portion of that data is not traditional structured data. It comes from documentation that people create, ideas that people are passing around, work that the company has experienced and gone through that are in Word docs or Google docs and, and Excel spreadsheets, et cetera, et cetera. And I, again, I know it sounds trite, but I've done a number of, um, of documentation management projects, not that I sponsored, I was just an implementer <laughs> and, um, yeah. and, and I point that out because um, documentation projects are only as good as the people that are willing to contribute to them. And usually a documentation project ends up being like a, a, a database for a data center as far as its layout is concerned. 10 minutes after you're done with the spreadsheet, it's not accurate anymore because people have made different decisions about what's confidential, what's not confidential, what deserves a seven year retention and what doesn't. And so all of the assumptions you made in building that platform go out the window and the product ends up not being used for what it was designed for. You gotta stop shopping at Amazon. Um, that, that, <laughs> so, that sounds like an Bezos in business. <laughs> yeah. But that's an opportunity for awesome. machine learning. I'm, I'm starting to hear machine learning solving a lot of that problem. Mach the machine learning figuring out, hey, that's sensitive. That's class one. That's class two. Hey, here's the metadata tags that should go on it. So that's kind of evolving now. When, mm -hmm. when I can do a search and find what I want within an enterprise, I'll be happy. I've never seen it. But the, you know, people are using machine learning to do the dirty work that no one ever had the time or wanted to do in, with documentation. You know, to, to wrap up, I would like to get the, the vision of the future of, from, the, from the three of you. You know, what is data analytics going to look like even two to four years from now? Not, not, next, not next year, but, but a few years, you know, is it going to be really transformed? What, what, what special and wild things are going to be going on that, that aren't going on now? Andy, what do you see in the, in the, in the murky future of data analytics? I think it's all about answers, not questions. It's about solutions, not problems. Um, mm -hmm. I believe that 
it's about packaging use cases to Mike's point, you know, solve a problem. Don't just collect data and pretend like you've got an answer, solve a problem. So, you know, we focus on specific problems, right? IT availability and performance about, you know, DevOps observability and feedback loops on security and anomaly detection and breach detection. That's what we're using AI and ML and, and analytics for specifically directed at these problems. We're getting, inputs from experts and people who have the problems. We're not just coming up with a data set and going, I wonder what we could solve with that. Um, I think that's the future, the immediate future. I think long-term there's a lot of blue sky stuff could happen. Mm -hmm. I think the immediate future is about packaged solutions to these use case problems and getting AI for want of a better term, probably more likely ML, probably more likely mathematics and statistics to actually just solve directed problems with known data sources uh, in known ways and letting people get creative, innovative, do other things while machines do the, the grunt work for want of a better uh, a term. Mm -hmm. That's where I think the near term is. Longer term, I don't know, lots of imagination, lots of innovation. Right, who knows? Uh, Mike, what do you see when you look into the future, say even one to three, five years down the road for data, data analytics, what's yeah. gonna be big? I'm, I'm gonna put it in two buckets. So when we talk about like the industrial use cases, agriculture use cases, uh, you're gonna see advancements, in, like let's take ag tech. You're gonna see them using this technology to figure out when I add more water, when I add more fertilizer, how to maximize an acre. So you're gonna see be able to forecast product better, be able to produce product better. So, you know, with predictive means, all that. But then there's the political side of it. You know, we sit here all day and we absorb information and we're getting programmed from analytics. We've already seen it through the election cycle. And like like my kids, my kids are early 20s. They, they can't imagine driving anywhere without a map. And I'm almost getting to that point myself, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm worried about the future of people's cognitive abilities because we're so reliant on analytics, AI, machine learning, telling us what to do. I, I think it's making us dumb. Interesting. Okay. Uh, Mark, your, your, your vision of the future when you look at data analytics, say two to four years from now, what, what's, what's, what's going to be wild and amazing? I, I'm going to do something really unusual and, and say very little. Um, <laughs> and, okay. and just say that uh, I'm hoping that my dream from the days of, of the early days of big data comes true in analytics. And that is that you can use it without thinking about it in the applications you touch all day long and gain right. benefits from it. That's what I'm really hoping comes true over the next three or four years. It, it's almost like the machine is going to be doing much of the cognitive work is what you're suggesting. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Huh. Uh, well, the three of you, I, I you know, Andy, Mike, Mark, I, I greatly appreciate you guys uh, sharing your expertise. I definitely learned something. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank thank you. you. It was a pleasure. All right. Take care.